Tri velike egipatske piramide, najslavnije drevne građevine, od prvih arapskih hroničara do danas nikad nisu prestale intrigirati ljude, svom impozantošću, ali i šutljivošću. Činilo se da te gigantske građevine, sagrađene od divovskih kamenih blokova danas nama nepoznatom tehnologijom, kriju u sebi neku drevnu poruku utkanu u njih matematikom i geometrijom. Puno je izračuna napravljeno pri otkrivanju raznih brojčanih odnosa koje piramide povezu s promjerom zemlje, iracionalnim brojevima i tome slično. No prije inženjera Roberta Buvala, danas slavnog autora, nitko nije obratio pažnju na značaje rasporeda piramida. Ustanoviši da one predstavljaju odraz zvježdja Oriona na tlu, Robert Buval započeo je svoju avanturu kroz arheologiju i mitologiju, bivajući uvijek ovdje, na rubu znanosti. Dobro večer. Robert Voala, autor je više knjiga koje se bave tajanstvenom prošlošću Egipta, koje se bave pitanjem povezanosti piramida i suzvržđa Orion i još niz drugih veza i tajni koje zapravo se otvaraju kada čovjek krene u tom smjeru. Dobro večer. Kako ste se našli u Hrvatskoj? Što vas je dovelo ovdje? Znači, sam se... Miss, uh, Mrs. Bianca Childs uh, in America last year and she told me about her uh, cruise that she does along the Dalmatian coast and that she was organizing uh, lecture conferences on, on the cruise and I got very interested and she invited me and here I am. Prisjetimo se na početku kako je sve počelo prije nekoliko desetljeća. Zapravo je vaša avantura sa piramidama počela možda i zbog toga što ste rođeni u Egiptu, a možda i zbog toga što ste slučajno vidjeli jednu od redkih zračnih fotografija piramida velikih u Egiptu koje u to vrijeme nisu bile toliko dostupne kao danas. Well, it started uh, in 1983. I happened to be working as an engineer in Saudi Arabia. And I took a trip to Egypt because my mother still lived in Egypt. And uh, I arrived in Cairo, rented a car to go to the city of Alexandria where my mother lives. But I stopped uh, on the way in the Museum of Cairo, the, the Antiquity Museum. And it's one of those things that uh, I just wanted to do a little visit. And uh, I had a camera with me. In those days, you could take pictures inside. And uh, I went to a room which belonged where all the artifacts of the fourth dynasty, the dynasty that supposedly built the pyramids of Giza. And uh, I was attracted to a picture on the wall, which had been taken by the uh, Air Force, the Egyptian Air Force in 1952. It was a direct overhead picture. And what I was attracted to is that I saw uh, what appeared to be as a plan. We had two pyramids of the same size. Uh, in a diagonal alignment and a smaller one offset of that, of that alignment and that uh, being an engineer that uh, was specialized in setting out buildings uh, especially in the desert it intrigued me because I saw a plan but a plan that didn't make sense and that's how it started U ono vrijeme kako je bilo objašnjenje egiptologa za to što eto tako jedna piramida je malo izvan nekog smjera kako su oni gledali na tu činjenicu Well it was known for a long time and Egyptologists know this that the pyramids have astronomical alignments uh, the most perfect of them is the great pyramid supposedly belonging to King Khufu uh, that the base of the pyramid is aligned to the astronomical cardinal directions. So each side of the pyramid has uh, aligned to north, south, uh, east and west. So this is well known, this is well accepted, it's a fact. What I was surprised at the time uh, when I saw this picture was that nobody had queried, nobody had asked why do we have two large pyramids on a diagonal alignment and a third one offset and much smaller because it looked like a like a plan uh, to to me 
uh, trained as an engineer and working with architects, but nobody had raised the question. It was not asked. Uh, and I was surprised because I wrote to many uh, Egyptologists at the time, and nobody had asked the question. And that's how it begins, really, is by asking a question. You know, why is this this way? Why does the apple fall? Why do the stars move? You know, so the question was this, and I decided I was going to investigate. Zanimljivo je uočiti da velike piramide izgrađene za vrijeme četvrte dinastije zapravo se dosta razlikuju od onih izgrađenih za vrijeme pete dinastije i to se također pokazuje jednim važnim putokazom u prošlost. Bilo bi dobro možda malo osvijetljiti tu činjenicu u kojoj mjeri su zapravo velike piramide bitno drugačije od onih kasnijih građenih. The uh, established chronology by Egyptologists is that Egyptian civilization began in 3000 BC or so and that uh, pyramid building began at about 2600 BC. Uh, the first so, pyramid that appears is a step pyramid, which is a, the pyramid allocated to King Zose, and followed by the fourth dynasty, the famous fourth dynasty that built these giant pyramids. There's a leap from step pyramids into smooth pyramids and of a much bigger scale. Uh, according to the chronology, the first fourth dynasty pyramids are built by King Sneferu, who is the father of King Cheops, Khufu. Uh, he builds two pyramids, giant pyramids, in a place called Dashur. It's about eight uh, or nine kilometers from the Giza necropolis. Then we have the famous fourth dynasty pyramids of Giza. Uh, these are the famous three pyramids, which I was talking about. And these are very different from any other pyramids of other dynasties that follow. They do not, the first thing that is noticed about these pyramids, apart from their size, is that they do not contain texts. They're totally anonymous. Hence the mystery of these pyramids. There is no inscriptions with, other than uh, theoretical ideas about who they belong to, coming from the ancient writers like the Greeks. Basically, we know nothing about them. They're just there. However, the dynasties that follow, uh, the 5th and 6th and 7th uh, dynasties, uh, are, their, their pyramids are much smaller, of much poorer constructions. It's a bit like there's a regression rather than a progression in technology. It's as if there's a brain drain or a, 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 a knowledge of how to build. Here we have the 4th dynasty pyramids built to perfection, to enormous size, uh, perfectly aligned. Here we have the fifth and sixth dynasties, which are shabby. Uh, some pyramids don't even look like pyramids, look like mounds, very, very roughly built. But the huge difference really is in the inscriptions. These pyramids of the fifth and sixth dynasty contain inscriptions. In fact, they're full of inscriptions inside. And these are known as the pyramid texts. So we have this large fourth dynasty pyramids, perfect construction with no inscriptions. They are mute, they don't speak. And those of the fifth dynasty, small, collapsed, badly constructed, but they speak. So the question is, do the fourth dynasty speak? And if they speak, in what language? What, what, how are we to read them? And this is where I come in. Što se tiče tih tekstova piramida napisanih na tim kasnim piramidama kasnih dinastija, o čemu oni pričaju i egiptolozi koji su ih prvi otkrivali, isčitavali i prevodili, kakav su imali odnos prema njima, koliko su pokušavali saznat nešto iz njih, koliko su ih smatrali vjerodostojnima i što ste vi u njima vidjeli? The pyramid texts were not known till 1880. For some incredible reason, archaeologists did not bother to explore the inside of 5th and 6th dynasty pyramids. The reason being that they didn't think there would be anything in them, let alone text, because they had the example of the big 5th, 4th dynasty pyramids that had no text. And uh, at the time, the director of the uh, antiquity department was a Frenchman called Auguste Mariette. And he was very, very stubborn. He said the pyramids are mute, they don't speak. However, 
they had to wait till he died for the new inspector, Gaston Maspero, who, uh, by sheer luck, had heard that one of the workers, uh, local workers, had followed the fox into a hall. And he went there with a lamp, and he entered what today we know as the Pyramid of Unas, last king of the fifth dynasty. And he saw these texts. He reported them to uh, Gaston Maspero. They started excavating, and they found the pyramid text. There are five royal pyramids of kings that have texts. And there are a few of so-called queens who also have texts. Collectively, they form the pyramid text. Uh, Egyptologists have pieced them together, put them in, uh, in a logical format, uh, paragraphs that they call utterances and lines. So when you check the pyramid text, this is a modern application to them, a bit like the Bible. We say chapter 4, line 3, you know. So we have utterance uh, 5, uh, line 16, you know. When I looked at the pyramid text, now, according to Egyptologists, the pyramid texts were uh, religious texts. They expressed a mythological religion. Uh, they believed that, uh, from what they understood, that it was a solar religion, that uh, the pharaoh was uh, incantations and uh, spells and magical spells to help the pharaoh take a journey and go to the sun god. So that's how Egyptologists interpreted this text in general. Uh, when I got to read this text, I did not see a, a solar religion. It's very obvious to somebody who knows a bit of astronomy that these people were speaking about stars. The, 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 the ritual that they envisaged was that somehow the, the, the dead king would be prepared uh, with some a process of mummification, we call it. And uh, in this final preparation, would be placed within a pyramid and that he would be converted into some sort of spiritual entity and fly to the stars. Uh, they give us specific directions. They give us stars of Orion and in the north, the circumpolar stars, the stars that never rise or set. They, they, they're part of a of the machinery of the sky. Right? Now, Orion, why? Because in their mythological history, which I now believe is probably not just mythological, <coughs> they speak of a god, <coughs> excuse me, that had come from the stars called Osiris. And that he and his sister, wife, established the civilization that became the pharaonic civilization that he was the first god king of Egypt. And the myth is, or the story is, that uh, he died being killed by his brother, jealous brother, before he could produce a child with his wife. The wife, Isis, regenerates his body through magical rituals and becomes pregnant posthumously and gives birth to a child, a male, a male child, which he calls Horus. Horus is the very first uh, man-god of Egypt, the first pharaoh, if you like. All pharaohs believe themselves to be reincarnations. But Osiris then departs to the sky and creates a kingdom in a stellar region, which today we call Orion. They call it the Duat. And this stellar region is supposed to be near a celestial Nile, very much like Egypt is. They, they speak of, a, of an Egypt in the sky. And this region is meant for future god kings, future Horus kings, to be undergone through the same process of mummification, preparation, and then transmitted into this zone. It is a kind of uh, afterworld, a stellar afterworld for the, the departed kings. So that's what I saw. And in other words, I was reading this text and extracting the astronomy from them. Some passages are very clear. I mean, they actually say the king goes to the stars. Others, of course, are very obscure. These are 5,000-year-old texts, maybe older. So there are passages I don't think we'll ever understand. But I extracted what I call level one, passages that are clearly understood. For example, uh, they tell us that 
certain stars, in particular the star Sirius, which was identified to the wife of Osiris. Osiris is Orion, Sirius is the star, uh, is Isis. That this star rises in the morning before sunrise after a period of invisibility of 70 days, which is true, and it rises at the time of the flood. Now, because they say this, I can work back using astronomy, using a phenom phenomenon we call precession, where the sky changes because the Earth is moving, the appearance of the sky changes. And I can tell you that the time is around the end of June. And I can even give you the date. We can extrapolate the information from this mythological text. So we can read them. We can understand them. That's fine with the text. But then we have the pyramids that don't have text. But they have astronomy. So now, with the help of this text, you can try and see what this monument is trying to say, what the designer is trying to say, in another form of language. I began to call it astroglyphics, if you like. He's speaking in an almost scientific language. He's speaking astronomy, if you like, which is what astronomers do today. Right? So that's how you inter I interpret those texts. I, I'm, I'm one of the pioneers in interpreting these texts, which were believed to be purely mythological, purely religious, that they are metaphors. They are metaphors for astronomical observations. Nakon tih otkrića pokušali ste potražiti zapravo e, sugovornike među ljudima koji se bave Egiptom. E, uglavnom je bilo više ili manje zainteresiranih, više onih manje, manje onih više, no pojavio se tu e, izvesni profesor Edwards i vrlo kasnije su u vašu informacije ušli zapravo e, spoznaje o tome u kom smjeru su usmjereni kanali, odnosno oni otvori u piramidi i slično. Pa kako je išla priča dalje koja će nas dovesti do dekodiranja Oriona na tlu Egipta? Well. First of all, at the time, and even now, I was not an, an Egyptologist. Uh, for a while I thought, uh, surely somebody must have discussed this uh, strange alignment of the pyramids and the small pyramid of Set. They must have seen uh, this uh, picture on the ground that looked like the picture in the sky. Because the texts speak about them. So Orion was mentioned in the text. Egyptologists knew this. So at first I didn't bother too much. I thought, okay, uh, it's none of my business. You know, I'm an engineer. But then I began writing to Egyptologists, and uh, you're quite correct. I mean, they, <coughs> uh, the reaction was rather strange. Uh, some were interested, but they said, uh, we don't think it's, uh, it's an in interesting idea, but uh, you know, it's, uh, we don't think you're right. Uh, others were even more uh, dismissing. They told me, in so many words, mind your own business, you're not an Egyptologist, uh, you don't know what you're talking about. But finally, I contacted uh, Sir Ivan Edwards, who was the, he died a few years ago, but he was the, the, the expert in the field of Egyptian uh, pyramids. He was the ex-curator of the British Museum, the uh, Egyptological Department, he's the authority. And he was interested. He was interested. He, was, uh, he thought I'd make a very, very convincing case, and he invited me to come and see him uh, when I had the chance. I was working in Saudi Arabia. What I didn't know at the time, surprisingly, I didn't have uh, facilities to libraries in Saudi Arabia. I couldn't get uh, articles. And... But what he informed me was that uh, the reason he was uh, interested in this is that there were shafts in the Great Pyramid uh, that one of them, the shaft pointing south from the king's chamber, was directed to Orion's belt. And that was what I was saying on the ground, that the pyramids represented Orion's belt. So that, to me, was... Uh, it, I felt, no, it, it cannot be a coincidence. There's too much relationship here. So anyway, I went to see him. And we discussed it, and I explained the theory. And uh, as all academics would tell you, well, publish it. You know, in those days, it wasn't so easy. I'm talking about 1984. Uh, being non-Egyptologist, not in the profession, he said you should publish it in an archaeological journal. He luckily introduced me to a new journal called Discussion in Egyptology, 
It took a while. It's, it's quite a long process to get these things published. Uh, in the, uh, it so happened that I immigrated to Australia with my family after Saudi Arabia. And uh, there I began to have access to a library. And eventually I managed to put a proper article into, into context. And I sent it to the journal with the recommendations from uh, Sir Ivan Edwards, which was fine. They published it. And that was published. And that is when the theory came out, if you like, uh, to the eyes of Egyptologists. Nothing happened. <laughs> it was very quiet. And I thought, OK, I've done my job, and that's it. But I wasn't satisfied. I, 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 uh, I expected some reaction. Uh, when I contacted Professor Edwards again, he said, don't worry, because Egyptologists have a reading list of uh, a waiting list of reading for 10 years. I mean, when an article is published, Egyptologists won't read it till, because they have so many things waiting. So I said, this is ridiculous. I'm not going to wait 10 years for, to get feedback on this. And that is when I decided to write a book. Kad ste napisali knjigu, tada ste privukli pažnju jer knjiga je postala jako popularna i naravno nije bilo moguće ignorirati, kao što je bilo moguće ignorirati neke znanstvene tekstove u časopisama koji nisu puno čitani. Kakve su tada bile reakcije na tu ideju koja će kasnije imati još i svoj razvoj? First of all, I'm flashing back to 1993. This was just the very, very early days of computers, uh, internet was uh, not the thing. Uh, publishing a book, uh, again, was a huge process. Uh, the research was, was not as we do today. I had to go to libraries, I had to uh, travel, uh, I had to find a publisher. But anyway, finally it came together. Uh, I found a publisher, uh, Random House, in England, in, in England, one of the big publishers. Uh, I suppose what was very uh, beneficial for me at the time was a discovery made by a German uh, engineer, uh, Rudolf Gantebrecht, who was uh, unknown to me, in fact unknown to everybody, he was exploring the shafts, this particular shafts, in the uh, Great Pyramid with a robotic machine. Uh, it's a long story, but I was asked by Professor Edwards to go and find out what they were doing with a letter of recommendation from him. And I met Rudolf Gantebrecht uh, in March 1993. He was on the verge of making a discovery. He was exploring the shaft of the Queen's Chamber, the southern shaft, and we know that he eventually found a door at the end of the shaft. I was with him a week before. I was the man who had worked out the alignment of that shaft of the shaft of the Queen's Chamber, pointing to Sirius. So of course, there was a correlation in our work. I was working the astronomy, he was working the mechanical exploration. And when he found the, the door, uh, he asked me to help him with the, with the, with the media and, and how to get this news out. It got entangled. There was a lot of activity in the media. Uh, that, uh, in a sense, excited my publishers. Uh, the BBC contacted me, they wanted to do a documentary based on my theory, uh, which was fine. Uh, the documentary was shot in Egypt in December 1993. The book was published in 94 in parallel with the BBC documentary. And then, like we say in English, hell broke loose. I didn't expect this reaction. Uh, the book shot to number one. It was one of the first books of this kind that hits the, the Sunday Times lists at this level. The BBC doc uh, documentary was a prime time program on a Saturday night. Uh, the reaction was amazing. Uh, the BBC was stunned by it because it was such a new idea, such a, uh, uh, an idea that interested the general public. Nobody expected this. Uh, the Egyptologists were caught by surprise. Uh, and I remember the, the morning after the documentary, I, I mean, People would stop in the street and say, you're the man with the pyramids and the stars. It, it got out of control. Uh, I was overwhelmed. What I didn't expect was the, uh, the, the, the backlash that came from the academics. I thought it was a good thing. It's uh, a new idea, new research. Uh, the Egyptologists were very, very aggressive. They, uh, they, they simply uh, attacked it arbitrarily. There was uh, uh, 
reviews in newspapers, uh, chat shows, and basically they didn't like it. They didn't like it. They, they, they didn't think it could be uh, something that uh, the Egyptians could do. I had no problem with this. I mean, there's no problem looking at stars. Everybody can look at stars uh, and make a plan and build them. Of course, the construction is something else. But and uh, I, from that day on, uh, I have, and until now, <laughs> I'm in the, in in in, the, in conflict with this academic establishment, which is a pity. Uh, astronomers have been very very open to the idea. And they see the logic. Uh, particularly certain senior astronomers, they got a lot of support. Uh, I'm pleased to say that now, finally, uh, a university decided to pass this theory the way it should be passed, to what they call a falsification test. All theories have to be tested this way until they can be proved to be either right or wrong. Uh, the University of Salento, the Department of Astronomy and Mathematics, passed it through the tests, very rigorous tests, uh, quantitative, uh, statistical, and their conclusion is that they cannot falsify it. It's a good theory. And that's it. That's as far as you can take it. But uh, the battle goes on. I mean, uh, uh, anybody who uh, is going to bring out a original idea of this kind that pokes into a established view is going to face this. this is, uh, I recognize this as part of the process. But it has entered uh, through the back door, if you like, into mainstream. It's been discussed in books, critically, some more openly, and it's, it's taken a life of its own. Iz početka vi zapravo i niste prepoznali vezu razmještaja piramida sa zvijezdom Orion. Prepoznali ste neke druge veze, ali ta veza je došla kasnije opet nekim nizom slučajnosti i sinkroniciteta. Na koji način je došla do vas zapravo ideja da je ovo doslovce preslik sa zvijezdom Orion? I također bi možda bilo dobro i neke druge astronomske aspekte reći koje su se tad pojavili zbog toga jer se precesija može vrtiti u natrag, pa su se pojavila neka druga sa zvijezdom Lava i tako u priči. Pa kako je zapravo došlo do prepoznavanja da je to otisa Koriona na zemlji. We're going back now to 1983. Uh, I was working, like I said before, in uh, Riyadh, in Saudi Arabia, and uh, every weekend we used to take the families and go out in the desert and do camping. It was the only recreation that we could do in this, in this uh, place. And uh, I had a friend of mine who was a navigator. Uh, Remember, this is the time before uh, Google Earth, before GPS, uh, before uh, Internet. And uh, being in the desert, and him being a navigator at sea, uh, we got discussing uh, how they navigate, and we started talking about the stars. Now, I had already seen this picture of the, uh, in the museum. I was thinking about it. And, and uh, we were sitting outside at night, and he said, I'm going to tell you how uh, we use the stars to direct ourselves when we navigate. And the first thing we establish is the direction, a cardinal direction, whether it's north or east or south. The easiest is east. Why? Because the sun rises east. And, but at night, we will use the stars of Orion. So I had read about Orion in the text. And he said the Orion belt rises due east. So if you see it rising, you know it's due east. And then you have a direction, and then uh, you can orientate yourself. But then when it is higher up, and if you want to know where the star Sirius is, bright star, the nice star, you draw a line from the three stars, you, you can draw a line backwards. And then just as an off thought, he said, well, it's not really a line. Uh, the, the little star is a bit to the left. And that's, uh, I saw the pyramid, if you like. Uh, to me, it was the correlation, two images blended into one. It was, it was like an overlap of my thoughts, pyramid stars. And that is how it started. Uh, what developed from that many, many years later was not just the correlation of three stars, is that although there is this correlation, in fact, the, the, the stars are positioned in such a way relative to the Milky Way 
which the Egyptians called the river in the sky, the same way as the pyramids are relative to the Nile. So you had a kind of map, if you like, not just the pyramids, but an overall map of a sky idea of the land of Egypt. But what was not working for the period that the Egyptologists said, 2500 BC, you had this image, but the angle made by the stars was much too shallow. The pyramids make a 45 degree angle with the meridian, with the Nile, but the stars in 2500 BC make an angle of about 17 degrees to the horizontal with the meridian, too shallow. They don't don't look, they look the same, but not in the same angle. And I thought, no, they would not, they would have been accurate. If the theory is correct, we expect them to be the same. So, this is when you take a leap of faith. You're going to go against not just the idea that there is a correlation, but you're going to check different dates. And that is where sometimes a researcher will not take this leap of faith because the argument was so well established. Pyramids were built in 2500 BCE. No. Nonetheless, I decided let's have a look what happens at different dates. Now, Orion, to them, at least in the text, is Osiris. Osiris had a beginning. They call it Zeptep. It literally means the beginning, the first time translates. So I thought, okay, the stars have a cycle. They have a beginning of the cycle of precession. Let me see what we see at the beginning. And you know, it's very easy now with computers. I had a very good uh, astronomical program. It takes a few seconds to type location, date, and, and what happens is that the stars begin to sink at the meridian. They go lower and lower and lower, and they reach a bottom position and then they go up again. The cycle is 13,000 years down, 13,000 years up. When they reach the lowest level in the present cycle, it gives a date of 10,500 BC. But then, the stars position themselves as the pyramids on the ground. We had a lock in 10,500 BC. When they do this, when they lock, they lock at a very specific time of the year. They lock at the spring equinox. Their position is such that they are what we call today right accession 18 hours. In, in normal language, they are at that point when the spring vernal point is rising in the east. It's a fact. So I thought, let's look in the east, because I knew there was a monument on this site, of course, which is the Great Sphinx, which is looking due east. What today we call 90 degrees uh, azimuth, due east. And I thought, what is he looking at? <laughs> why, why is he there? And at that date, he is looking at a constellation. And this constellation is the constellation of Leo, the lion. It's a very distinct. Whereas at the date that Egyptologists allocate to the Sphinx as the pyramids, this constellation is way off to the north. And that to me was it. We had two, side, two monuments on the ground on the same side, locking in two different directions at the same time, giving a date of 10,500 BC. To me, coincidence was very unlikely, probabilistic, statistically very difficult. But the date was way off from what Egyptologists were ready to accept. And uh, I, I contacted a colleague, uh, Graham Hancock, who is here, uh, saying, look, uh, do you want to do a book with me on this one? Because he had written a book uh, mentioning my theories. And that's how we decided to expose it to the public. It, we knew it was going to be very controversial, because not only Egyptologists were not accepting this correlation theory, but they were not going to accept that date. It pushed the whole thing back to 8,000 years before we established it, but we did. And uh, again, the whole stuff started again, and, but that's where it stands. The correlation theory is 
such that it forces us to consider an earlier date. Now, astronomy cannot confirm whether it's physically that old. They're speaking of the date. They draw it in a map, in a, in a, in a, in a, in a stone map, if you like. Where it became very interesting is that while we were doing this correlation research, there was a group of people, uh, a professor at Boston University, Dr. Robert Schock, with a researcher, John West, an American, who were using geology. They had examined the Sphinx, and they argued that the erosion on the Sphinx, and particularly on the wall in which the Sphinx is carved, the geology suggested strongly that the erosion was much, much older. And since the Sphinx had to be carved in this, it's, it's like a horseshoe pit, the, the, the walls were exposed during the, the excavation of, this, of, the, of the hole. Therefore, if the erosion was much, much older, then the Sphinx must be much, much older. And they come up with the date roughly of five to 7,000 BC. Now, Dr. Schock, I've written a book with him now, believes that it probably is much older, around the 11th millennium. So we now have two hard sciences. There is astronomy and there is geology. And these two together are arguing for an older site. It's very difficult for, um, uh, for Egyptologists to stomach this. But scientists are very open to this because we're talking science. We're talking, we're talking the only tools that we have to date sites if there is no other means. You can't date stone with carbon dating. It's, it, there is no process yet. Astronomy can if you know if there is an alignment and you know what they're aiming at. And geology, of course, can be datable. It's a dating tool. And these two sciences says this place is old. And the astronomy is very precise. This place is not old, only older. It seems to give that date of 10,500 BC. And that is very, very controversial. But that's where it stands. Naravno da ne možete znati, ali što mislite zbog čega je to prvo vrijeme ZEP TEPI uh, baš se zbivalo 10.500 prije nove ere? Uh, teško je svakom koga zanima ta materija ne primijetiti da se u to vrijeme uh, zbivaju uh, vrlo neobična zbivanja, bez obzira gledali ih iz pozicije geologije, uh, klasične, koja pokazuju da su brlo ra- brzo vlasti planinski lanci ili možda iz kataklizmičke uh, pak uh, kuta glednja, uh, dakle mnogi mitovi govore o kataklizmi i sad ovdje imamo 10.500 prije nove ere. Pa me zanima što vi mislite zbog čega je to vrijeme toliko značeno? Well, there, there are other texts. Uh, uh, let's stick just to the Egyptian context. There are other texts, not just the pyramid texts, of a much later date. They're known as the Edfu texts. These texts seem to be copies of copies of all the texts. They're inscribed on the walls of a temple in Upper Egypt, which we call the Edfu temple. In fact, it's the temple of Horus, the, 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 the god Horus. These texts uh, have been examined, of course, by Egyptologists and, and uh, more in our field by Graham Hancock, who wrote a book about them, and myself. They speak of two, they're very complicated, they, they fill books and books and books. But two sections of these texts are very interesting. They speak of what they call, the, or we interpret as being the gods, the sages, the wise ancestors. Having come from somewhere, in some cases, they speak of boats to have arrived uh, in the land of Egypt at the time that they call the first time, which we have dated astronomically to be the, about 10,500 BC. They call it, these people arrive in the Zep Tepi time, the first occasion. And they bring plans. They have a knowledge and they want to restore and rebuild what they know from somewhere else. So that's very interesting. And they actually, uh, their plans, they claim, uh, if one interprets it, there's many ways, came from the sky. They, they, they were given plans 
or they understood plans to build these temples. These temples are going to be sort of stone libraries, uh, repositories of knowledge. And so they build them. And the, if one wants to take it a bit further, they, they're probably the originators of the idea of building pyramids. They do speak of something very interesting. They say that the region where the pyramids are, we know this as the Menphite region, that the original temples, they speak of a book, of a, of a, of a, of a book that is known as the specifications. This is exactly the specifications of where the original mount temples are. Now, there are mounds there, natural mounds. Strange enough, the pyramids are built over these mounds. We know that the Great Pyramid is actually capping like a plug over a mound. And, may, and all the other pyramids seem to have mounds under them. The, what was important about these mounds, we don't know. But we begin to suspect that they were, pre, well, they were prehistoric, of course, because they exist. But there are tunnels under them. Maybe these are older. However, what is interesting is some of these mounds, when we relate them together, they, for, they form a very curious geometry. They are interrelated with a geometry that produces an astronomy, very much like the pyramid. Uh, two mounds point to the, to the winter solstice sunrise. Others produce an angle of 45 degrees. It's very bizarre, but they seem to have formed a vast uh, open air astronomical plan, if you like, on, on a vast scale, uh, roughly about 40 kilometers to 20 kilometers large. So that's what we hear from this text. The other is even more interesting. They, uh, they speak of an event that happened at that time, an event that happened at this Zepetepi time. Uh, they call it the Great Battle, where the god Horus somehow brings together and defeats the, the forces of evil. And they give us a date, not a calendrical date. They give us, sorry, not a time date. They say it happened on the first occasion, which we think is 10,000, and it happened on what they call in their calendars the first of Tibi. Now, we, when we translate this first of Tibi to the Gregorian calendar, it's the 19th of October. Now, what is the 19th of October? Well, to anybody who has studied Egyptian history, 19th of October is a very important date, or rather the first of Tibi. Because we know that various temples, particularly the temple of Abu Simbel, great temple of Ramses II, is aligned to the sunrise on the first of Tibi. Why? Because they regarded that date as a memory of a great event that happened that the Pharaoh had to not only celebrate, but even things like the coronation of the kings were performed at that time of year. A bit like Christmas, if you like, but in a grandiose scale. But the, the Sphinx, here is interesting. Now the Sphinx, even Egyptologists agree, in terms of its representation, it's a lion with a man's head, and they believe because of the text and because of the, 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 the imagery that is the, the symbolism, it represents the god Horus, Horus of the horizon. Now, Horus of the horizon in these texts is the first king who is crowned in the first occasion on that date of the 19th of October. Amazingly, this is part of a new study I've done, there is a causeway that runs next to the Sphinx, pointing to the sunrise. It is, even today, the sun hits this point on the 19th of October. So now we're locking these pyramid texts with the Edfu texts, with the construction on the site, and it's not locking to a, to a date. Something happened in their mind, in their memory, on what today we call the 19th of October, around 10,500 BC, which was so important to them that they memorized it and, and built these structures. What it is, I cannot tell you. But it must have been something very, very important, very dramatic. Some say it's the remembrance of a flood. 
that, they, that everything was destroyed and they wanted to conserve the memory. Uh, others say, like my uh, colleague Graham Hancock, that something caused a huge destruction of, uh, of, uh, of, of, uh, of civilization that existed before, it wiped it out, and there is a desire to uh, not only memorialize it, but to, to conserve the, the, the memory so that it is avoided again. I think more than likely, uh, because we know that it happens, there must have been some sort of cataclysm. Comet, flood, comet and flood, perhaps. But I suspect that the Edfutex are remembering a history that some people came from where we don't know. They seem to carry knowledge. They seem to want to conserve this knowledge. They want to conserve this knowledge in the best possible way that it will survive. Monuments, indestructible monuments. They seem to be speaking in terms of a language that will be understood by everybody everywhere. Mathematics and astronomy. The Great Pyramid seems to be, I know it sounds strange to say this, a sort of giant GPS. It's giving us a location on Earth, in the sky. It seems to be uh, giving us a, an alphabet to, uh, to make it speak. Because I could go on forever on this, but when we begin to analyze this monument in its geometry, it's producing very strange, exotic mathematics. It's producing uh, universal constants, uh, pi, phi, uh, Euler's number. It's pouring out, it's, there's many at the moment, because that's a very uh, embryonic study. We have many uh, mathematicians, astronomers, architects who are now uh, getting into it. It's a bit like uh, cosmology. Suddenly we wake up, we realize that there are exoplanets, that there are other galaxies. And every day there is more news. Uh, the, the astronomers every day publish. Uh, we found uh, new planets, we found new galaxies. The universe is bigger. It's pouring out once you make a breakthrough. Well, this is coming out of the pyramid. We realize that it's designed according to some geometrical plan that once you, 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 you click it, once you make it speak, it pulls out information. What the information is about, we don't know. What we know is that whoever designed it intended it to be read, and intended to be read with astronomy and mathematics. There you are. So this is the, where we're reaching in 2017, it's the beginning of this, uh, this motion. Još jedno pitanje za kraj. Uh, postoje ljudi koji smatruju da je znanje u suvremeni krug civilizacije doneseno od neke pretpotopne civilizacije što podrazumijeva kataklizmu. Postoje autori koji pišu o ljudima koji su došli iz svemira ili bićima i tako dalje. Zanimljivo je u tom kontekstu pogledati tu strast prema Orionu i kraljevima koji se žele vratiti na Orion. Jeste li kad razmišljali uh, ako je moguće da su neki donositelji civilizacije došli iz svemira, da su možda baš došli iz Oriona ili ste, ili ipak bi to bila samo astronomska lokacija? Well, the simple answer is yes. And the reason is that uh, hardly a few years ago I would not have answered your question. I did not speak about such things. But uh, I have, I happen to be very lucky to have a, uh, as friend and now as co-author a one of the most prominent uh, astrobiologists uh, living. Astrobiology is a very, very recent science. It's now uh, very popular. There are many astrobiologists, but it was founded by uh, two uh, Cambridge researchers, Sir Fred Hoyle in the 19, late 60s, and uh, Chandra Wickramasinghe. Chandra Wickramasinghe is of uh, Sri Lankan origins, who came to settle in England and got his PhD at uh, Cambridge University and has, <coughs> excuse me, been professor of, of astrophysics, uh, uh, astronomy, but eventually founded the, uh, the first astrobiological, <coughs> excuse me, laboratory in Cardiff University. So he's the, he's the man. And I've known him for many, many years. And he has always been interested in the question you've asked. Because what astronomers know today is that uh, 
Well, let's put it as simply as possible. Uh, I'm quoting a phrase from Carl Sagan, uh, the American as, uh, cosmologist who died, unfortunately, uh, a few years ago. He said, we are star stuff. You, me, the cameras, the chair, uh, the boat, uh, the whole planet, everything that's on it is made of star material, star stuff. Why? Because now we know, science has taken us to the point that, let me go through a very quick process. Um, we go to the Big Bang, the, the, the singularity. That's what we understand from cosmologists and astrophysicists and so forth. That something happened 14 and a half billion years ago where energy uh, somehow created matter or particles of matter. The first particles are the subatomic particles. We had the protons, the neutrons, and the electrons, and the quarks floating about, whizzing uh, all over the place. Uh, I'll cut it short. Uh, half a billion years later, the four forces of, of nature, that's how the whole world is held together, very, very delicately with the strong nuclear force, the weak nuclear force, the gravitational force, and the electromagnetic force. The weakest of these forces are gravity. It's the last one that brought things together. First, the strong nuclear forces pulled these particles together, formed nuclei of atoms, attracted the electrons that created elements. The first elements, helium and hydrogen, floating about. Gravity puts them together, forms a com compaction that forms stars, forms galaxies. I'm moving very fast, of course, here. And then stars begin to grow. Are so gravitational forces such in some of the stars. The heat is so intense. These helium and hydrogen simple elements begin to compact, form the heavy elements, iron, calcium, sulfur, and so forth. And eventually the star explodes. The supernova is formed, it spews out its heavy elements. They get caught by dust, form comets, shoot around and hit a planet. They seed the planet with the heavy elements. That's the panspermia theory that was presented in the 70s. Now it's widely accepted. We came from somewhere and somehow life, non-life became life. We even now begin to think that they carried even perhaps a much older evolution that might have contained our DNA. If so, then we are star beings, if you like. We are we're recycled star beings on a different planet. It is a very controversial theory, but it's beginning to look like it's correct because, and lo and behold, now uh, astrophysicists think that the, the place where, where these, uh, these, these, these comets, these meteorites struck, came from that zone of Orion. We call it the star nursery. So amazingly, the, the ancients, whoever they were, seemed to have intuited that, or they knew that. I cannot tell you how. There may be a, maybe a way of knowing it without coming through this whole process of science. Whatever it is, their texts are saying in metaphoric language what we are discovering today. Now, what do we do with this? I don't know. But I can tell you one thing, is when you hear an astrophysicist, a theoretical physicist, trying to explain to you, or to me, I, I presume you're not a theoretical physicist, what he has in mind. If he's going to talk to another theoretical physicist, he's going to go on a blackboard and they're going to talk mathematics. That's how they talk to each other, so that one understands exactly what the other wants to say. But when he's going to talk to us, he has to talk metaphorically. You know, there was a singularity and it blew up, it became like a... He talks like the ancient Egyptians. So to me, that's very interesting. So are we reading science that is spoken metaphorically? Or are we reading superstitious people who thought they could go to the stars? As a scientist, as an engineer scientist, I have to say, we have to be open because of what we know today. So to answer your question in such a long way, 
is that yes, of course we're thinking of this. We should be thinking of this. Because now we know that we exist in a most extraordinary, mysterious, enormous universe that behaves in a manner that we thought is counterintuitive. We know of quantum mechanics. We know that uh, there could be multi-universes. We could be, there could be civilizations that uh, are billions of years older and therefore more uh, evolved. Uh, when we compare ourselves to the chimpanzee, we find that the only difference between them and us is 1% of genetic difference. Look what we've done with 1%. What if there is a civilization with 1% more? 2% more, 10% more. What can be done with such a, 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 a paradigm shift of science is we can't imagine it. There are scientists today that know we'll be able to do things. We will go to the stars, there's no question. We will travel, to the, we will download the human brain, put it on the laser beam, we know it can be done. We have the science, we don't have the technology, we don't have the funds, but we will do it. So of course we have to think of these things. It's kosher. It's no more taboo, you know. Gospodine Buval, hvala vam na ovom razgovoru. Doviđenja i sretan put gdje god ste uputili. I enjoyed it. I have to congratulate you because you you did your homework. Usually I don't have people who did their homework so well. You know what to ask. Uh, I'm enjoying this trip uh, in Croatia. I have to admit that I don't think I would have come had I not been invited. Uh, it wasn't in my mind, but I discovered a wonderful country, really. Um, very nice people. Yeah, it's a pleasure. Okay.